century. Well, that, of course, was Paul uh, expressing why uh, he was doing the things that he did in God's kingdom. Now, if I was to ask you, uh, what is the most common fear people have, I'm sure you would all come up with the same answer, and that is what? <laughs> wow, you guys, come on. All the surveys say it's public speaking. People are afraid to get up in front of a crowd and speak. Now, I think that on the surface is correct, but I think what underlies that is a much more primordial fear. And that is the fear of failure. I think all of us uh, struggle with that at some point in our lives. Uh, if we, we're going to attempt something, or we want to attempt something, but we don't because we are afraid we might not do well. And I think that is the number one reason why we don't share our faith. The number one reason why we don't tell people about Jesus, why we don't invite them to church with us, why we don't reach out to them, is because we're afraid they're going to say no at the very least, and at the most they might say, well, you religious wacko, leave me alone. And then we interpret that as personal rejection, and as we process that, we conclude that we failed. Because if we would have successfully shared Jesus, or successfully invited people to church, they would have responded positively. I hope I can disabuse us of that notion this morning. So we're going to look at how do we share our faith in a 21st century context, because we're sharing a first century faith. And so how do we do that? And we're going to ask two questions. One is this, does God really want me to share my faith? If he's the one that saves people, why does he need us? Well, the only answer I can come up with to that question is because that's the way he has decided to do it. Uh, Matthew, one of the more uh, famous passages in the Bible, at least to Christians, is Matthew 28, 19. And Jesus says, you know, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. And then he tells disciples, disciples therefore go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he has given us the command to go and make disciples. Now, the English doesn't quite do the Greek justice there because there's a grammatical problem. And what we do is we tend to focus in on go and think that's the subject. But it is not the subject. It is not the command either. It's actually a participle. Many of you have heard me repeat this, and you're probably thinking, I wish he wasn't saying that again. But for the sake of those that might not understand it, go is a participle. And what it actually means, more accurately means, is while going, make disciples. In other words, while going about your daily lives, while being who you are, doing what you do, in that context, make disciples. You don't have to go somewhere. Now, God will call individuals to the mission field to go here and go there, and, and that's a whole other thing. But for most of us, our mission field will be Washougal, Camas, Vancouver, wherever we happen to be. And so, in that context, he has told us to make disciples. Well, then there's this question, how do we adapt the first century message to our 21st century friends without changing the message? We always have to be careful when we're adapting that we, we adapt the, the, the means, but we don't change the message. Because the power is in the message. When we're telling someone about Christ, the power is in the fact that we're telling them about Christ. And the Holy Spirit then will take that and make it alive in their hearts if he so chooses. 
There's a story that's told about uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great 19th century uh, preacher at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Tremendous preacher. Anybody that's ever gone to any kind of preaching class has heard about Spurgeon. And he's been held up as a great expositor, and he was. Now, in the 19th century, they were blessed without technology. They didn't have all this stuff. So when they were going to speak somewhere, uh, they would go to that place in advance, they would go into the room, and they would practice their speaking to see how their voice was going to resonate throughout the room and so on and so forth. And the story goes that Spurgeon was speaking somewhere in a large auditorium, so he went there ahead of time, the place was empty, and he's standing up on the podium, and he's repeating the phrase, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, that's John the Baptist presenting Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. And he just keeps repeating that with various inflections and things. And there was a custodian in the building. And the custodian heard that over and over, was convicted, fell on his knees, and accepted Christ. Now that's how the Holy Spirit works. So, can we take from that then that all we have to do is go stand on some street corner and repeat some nice phrase from Scripture? I hope that's not what we get from that. What I want us to get from that is God will take the word spoken as He sees fit and make it alive in people's hearts. So, having said all of that, I know you're still skeptical. And you're thinking, well, I don't know. Show me how that works. Okay, I'll show you how that works. We're going to take a, a few examples from Scripture and see just how they went about telling people about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And the first example we're going to use is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now surely, surely, Jesus would have no trouble presenting the message, would he? I mean, when he was here on this earth, it's the only time ever that we had both a perfect message and a perfect messenger. We still have a perfect message, but we are all flawed messengers. No matter how great a speaker we are, no matter how uh, enthusiastic we are, how persuasive we are, we're still imperfect. Jesus was not. He was perfect. So surely he would have met with great success. Well, actually no. Of all the people Jesus spoke to, very few believed the message. And some who said they believed the message didn't really care about the message. They were simply interested in taking part in a miracle. They had a need and they wanted it met, you know. Well, we, we hear that a lot uh, today, that uh, we want to be uh, seeker-sensitive. We want to reach those people that are out there seeking after God. Well, according to Scripture, there is no such thing. See? Romans says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who seeks after God. So what is it they're seeking? Well, they're generally seeking to have some felt need met. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I have felt needs too, and I like to have them met. But we don't need to be sensitive to their felt needs, and that doesn't mean we're a bunch of insensitive louts. Don't take it where I'm not intending it to go. But we need to be sensitive to the message and sharing the message with them as best we can and letting the Holy Spirit do His work. In evangelism, and I don't even like to use the word because it just strikes fear into our hearts, you know. Oh no, not another message on evangelism. All evangelism means is simply sharing your faith. But in evangelism, success is measured in numbers. And if that's the case, Jesus Christ was a colossal failure. And I, I don't mean any heresy by saying that. But if 
evangelism is measured in numbers, Jesus didn't do very well. And if you look throughout Scripture, you find people who we, we consider to be the great men and women of the faith that had very little success in having people accept their message. You read the book of Jeremiah. All through the book, Jeremiah is telling people about God, trying to get people to come to God. There was no great revival under Jeremiah. If Jeremiah were alive today, he would not be invited to speak at one single church conference. He had no success. If success is measured in numbers. But in God's kingdom, it is not. In God's kingdom, success is measured by a, one word. And that word is obedience. If we are obedient to what God has called us to do, we are successful regardless of the outcome. So God has called us to make disciples. So when we share with somebody our faith, or when we invite them to come to Christ, or when we even invite them to come to church, and I'm not saying coming to church equates with coming to Christ, but it's a door that a lot of people use to get there. So that's a good thing to do. But we have been successful as soon as we tell people. Uh, the late James Kennedy, he's pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida. And he had a great, great definition of successful evangelism. And this is what he said. He said, successful evangelism is when we take the opportunities Christ gives us to share him with others and leave the results to him. You see? But we're so result-oriented in everything else we do that it's hard for us to separate that out. And we think we have successfully shared when someone responds positively. That's not true. When someone responds positively, it's never because we successfully shared, it's because the Holy Spirit made the message alive in their hearts. We have successfully shared when we do just that. That's all we need to do. So while you're living your life, while you're being a normal person, you don't have to have the Bible memorized, you don't have to have a college education, you don't have to have anything except Jesus Christ in your heart, and you are fully equipped to tell people about him. In that Matthew 28 portion, Jesus never tells us, in fact, the, nowhere in the Bible does it ever tell us to go into all the world and make believers. Now, why would it not tell us that? Because it's an impossibility for us. We can't make believers. Only the Holy Spirit can make believers. We're told to go and make disciples. And Paul, very plain about it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. People are saved by grace through faith, and both of those things are a gift of God. Our job, now, we should quote the, the following verse, because it says that, we are saved by grace in order to do good works which God ordained beforehand. And one of the good works we're supposed to do is telling people about the faith. So what were Jesus' methods? Well, he used parables. He used stories. Um, he would quote some scripture from time to time. But mainly he told stories that people could relate to, that, that people could understand. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. In fact, in most cases, it's probably better that you're not. Just tell people what Jesus has meant in your life. Another thing I've noticed about Jesus is he made it a point all through his ministry to have a small group and hang with them. If you are going to live the Christian life in all of its abundance that Christ talked about, one thing you're going to have to have is some sort of a small circle of intimate friends. 
You know, it can be a men's group, it can be a woman's group, it can be a home group, it can be whatever, but you need that circle of friends that you can uh, depend on in times of, of strife and trouble in your life and that you can minister to in times of strife and trouble, trouble in their lives. It's just one of the essentials. You need to be involved in that sort of a thing. If Jesus needed it, we certainly need it. Another thing we see about him, he hung with his circle, but he reached out beyond them. Uh, John chapter 4, the classic example, where Jesus goes to the, to, to the Samaritan woman, you know, the one that had all the husbands and all that, and you remember now, she's a Samaritan, so the Jews hate Samaritans. You, you look at the way the, the Muslims hate the Jews. Well, that's the way the Jews felt about the Samaritans. And in fact, when they were traveling, uh, they would go way out of their way just so they wouldn't have to even go through Samaria. So what does Jesus do? He crosses every cultural line, reaches out to not only a Samaritan, but to a woman. Now, don't get mad at me. In the cultural context, that was some talking here. And not only was she a woman, but she was a loose woman. She didn't have any morals. She's sleeping with half the guys in town. And Jesus goes to her. And his, his disciples, his small group, is astonished. We're not to discriminate in our evangelism. We're not to pick and choose. Now, with our group here, you guys have your prejudices, and you guys discriminate. Because everybody does, by the way. But we don't discriminate, at least I don't know of any of us that do, about color or ethnicity. But the way we discriminate is, when it comes to sharing our faith, well, we'll look at some people and we'll say, well, they're not going to buy it anyway. So why bother? Then we'll look at another person and say, oh, they really need it. So I'm going to tell them about Jesus. Okay. Don't do that. Don't pick and choose because we don't know. And believe me, your dentist, your doctor, your financial advisor, whoever it is, need Jesus just as much as some poor guy sleeping under a bridge. Their spiritual need is no different. So don't pick and choose. Jesus befriended people. Now if you do this, if you reach out to people, if you uh, cross uh, the, the, the cultural norms and things, uh, and by cultural norms that we're going to cross might be within our, our group of religious friends, because they have an idea of what it means to be a Christian, and uh, God may call you to stretch that a little bit in who you're dealing with. So be forewarned, if you do that, there will be a little bit of criticism. And again, let's look at Jesus. Nobody would criticize him, would they? Well, in, in Matthew chapter 11, we find out. We read this. <clears throat> he says, for John, now remember John the Baptist? He was a real aesthetic guy. He, was a, he, wouldn't, he never broke a rule. He just wore old clothes and lived in the desert. and He was just one of those kind of guys. So he says this. says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him. A glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wow. So what he's saying is, if you're really involved in this, there will be criticism. And it doesn't matter what you do. Because the criticism isn't about you, it's about ultimately the message. It's God they're rejecting, it's not you. So you can be like John the Baptist and you can follow every rule and live a life of poverty, give all your money to the poor you're still going to be criticized. Or you can uh, go the other way and be like Jesus and go to parties with the sinners and do whatever it is, and you're going to get criticized. And you can be right in the middle, and you'll still get criticized. But don't worry about that. Well, let's look at a couple others here. Uh, if, if Jesus was our number one uh, evangelistic person who would be two and three? Peter and Paul. Paul and Peter, wouldn't you say? Now, these guys really had it going on. They knew what was happening. 
And one of the first things we see when we look at Paul is this. And we're back to our go thing again. Location has nothing to do with it. You know, when I was in seminary, they used to have a little thing they'd tell uh, people heading for the mission field. They said, if you aren't sharing your faith here, a plane ride isn't going to change that. You see? So, if you think, well, if, if God would just call me to the mission field, then I would be a missionary. No, you wouldn't. Because if you're not doing it here, you're not going to do it there. It's that simple. So, in Acts chapter 28, verse 30, we see where Paul is. And, of course, we find that he is in prison. And here's what we see. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Now, like I said, that verse doesn't mean a whole lot until we set it in context. And the context is, Paul is in prison under house arrest. And instead of him saying, well, now I'm stifled, now I can't do anything, now I can't tell anybody about Jesus. He says, now the gospel's going to go to the Gentiles, and then look what he follows it up with. He says, and they will listen. You see, he had great faith that the Holy Spirit was going to make the gospel message real. And so, what does he do while he's, while he's there? He simply does this. He writes the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. We call them the prison epistles. And so while he's in prison, supposedly a place where he couldn't do anything, he writes these epistles that endure for over 2,000 years. And they went out to all the Gentiles, and that includes us. And so he was right when he said they will believe, because we believe. But again, if we measure it by numbers, he wasn't very successful. Because there's a lot more people that don't believe. But it's not measured by numbers. As soon as he gets out of prison, well, he was in there for talking about Jesus, the bottom line. As soon as he gets out of prison, now I would think the guy would say, you know what, I've been on, depending on how you want to calculate it, two or three of these missionary journeys, and you, you know, I've been shipwrecked, I've been all this stuff, I've done all this stuff, and while I was in prison, I did a good job of it, I bucked up, and I wrote these epistles, I've done well, I'm going to retire. I'm going to take it easy. But what does he do? He goes right back to talking about Jesus. Right back to making disciples. Right back to doing the work of the kingdom. And God notices that. And he's highly rewarded. He gets his head cut off. Now how's that for a reward? Well, you see, now, in, in a human context, we think, well, that's terrible. But do you suppose if you could have talked to Paul 30 seconds after he lost his head, he had any regrets? Of course not. This is the apostle that said to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. As soon as he lost his life, his human life, his eternal life, was realized. So was Paul a success? Absolutely. He was obedient to what God had called him to do. Well, what about Peter? You know, in Acts chapter 10, we in 11, we have the story about Peter going to, being called to go to the house of Cornelius and Centurion and tell him about Jesus. Well, now, if there was anybody the Jews hated as much as the Samaritans, it was the Romans occupying their country. And Cornelius was a Roman centurion. They were the occupiers. How do people feel about foreigners occupying their country? They don't like it, do they? And so Peter says, no, well, I'm not going to go. It's all wrong. This guy's a Gentile for one thing. They didn't like them either. He's a Roman, he's an oppressor of our people, an occupier of our country, and you want me to go tell him about Jesus? No. 
But the Spirit prevails upon him, and he goes anyway. And horror of horrors, Cornelius receives the message and comes to know God. So what we want to get from this Paul and Peter scenario is simply that location makes no difference. Whether you're in a prison where Paul was or in a palace where Cornelius was, the message needs to be shared. Now finally, what about the accommodation thing? What about customizing the message without changing it? Well, Cherie read for us from 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, where Paul was talking just about that. You know, to the weak I became weak, to the strong I became strong, etc., etc. But, but we always have to ask the question then, how far do we go with this accommodation? And that's a reasonable question and one we'll look at. How far should we go to identify with those who are, we are trying to reach? Well, the answer is, it depends. And we don't like those kind of answers because we like static lines, we like boxes, we like to know what the rules are. But it's a, a dynamic line. Sometimes we should go this far, sometimes we should go further. And it depends on who we are, you see. For instance, biblical example, Timothy and Titus. Both were Gentiles. Both were going on the mission field. Both were going to end up leading churches. Yet Paul insisted that only Timothy needed to be circumcised. And not Titus. Now why would that be? because of the audience. Where Timothy was going was a much higher density of Jews and Jewish believers. And it was important to them. It didn't involve the message. So Paul says, we're going to do this, Timothy, <laughs> for the sake of the gospel. But with Titus, it was not an issue. And you see the difference. If it's for the sake of the message, make the accommodation. But if it's not, if it's going to change the message, don't make the accommodation. When the gospel was not at stake, he was willing to compromise many things in order to win others to Christ. See? Remember, God looks at the heart not the outside trappings. I remember, and I can't remember the couple's name, but it's been 10 or 15 years ago, and there was a couple over in Portland, and they were starting a church, and I, I would guess they were late 40s, early 50s, and I mean, they were tattooed from head to foot, and rings, and bikes and things all over them and the, the the people group they were trying to reach were the street people in Portland and so uh, I invited them over here to speak to the church and our folks were a little shocked when they saw them but it was okay and they were telling with us telling us about their ministry well in the course of their story and I you would never believe this he was an investment banker and I forget what she was, some kind of a professional. And they had pictures of them taken a few years before, and they looked like you would expect an investment banker to look like. And she looked like what you would expect a professional woman to look like. They totally changed their entire looks because they wanted to reach this people group that looked like that. And that's okay. Because if they dress like an investment banker and a professional, those kids aren't going to listen to them. Okay? So they did that in order to accommodate the gospel. Now, you can only do that if God calls you to do it. If I went and got a bunch of tattoos and earrings and stuff, it'd be fake. You know? And they still wouldn't listen to me. So, so when you, those kind of things, you know, God has to be involved in. But that's okay. Because their message was going out and it didn't matter whether they had a tie or they had tattoos. See? 
when the gospel is not at stake, be willing to accommodate. And that's really what the whole Acts chapter 15 is known as the first church council. And it's, the very purpose of that council was to answer that question. It was how far do we go in accommodating people? And it's interesting to me that at the end of that, that council, you, you can read it for yourself, uh, Peter was there, Paul was there, all the big guns were there, James was the, the chairman of the council, Jesus' brother, half-brother. And here's what they came up with in dealing with the Gentiles. They said, here are the rules. Tell them not to worship idols. Tell them not to indulge in sexual immorality. Tell them not to put anything before God. That's pretty much it. That's simple, isn't it? It's a simple set of rules, a simple set of guidelines. So if you can make the accommodation, boy, I guess I'm having a terrible time with that today. If you can make the accommodation without violating any of those rules, go for it. It's okay for the sake of the message. But again, and I want to end with this, God has called the vast majority of us to simply live our lives in a way that reflects favorably upon Him. And when opportunity arises, share the fact that you know Christ. And you might be surprised at what happens. And I know that's hard. So I'll give you one step down. Sharing Christ is the best. And if you just really struggle with that, the next step down, invite them to church with you. Bring them here, and I'll tell them about Christ. Okay, or somebody else here will. But there's the best. But you know, we often don't reach the best, do we? I mean, I'm certainly not the best pastor on earth. And when I was a truck driver, I wasn't the best truck driver on earth. I was good, and I hope I'm pretty good at being a pastor. But I wasn't the best. And none of you are the very best at anything either. And that's no, no offense, men. It's just truth. And even those few people in the world that are the best only stay the best for a little while because somebody comes along and knocks them off. You see? So if you can't do the best, don't say, well, I'm not going to do anything. Just do a little bit. Take it, take it down a notch and start there. You might be surprised at what God will do. Because he's the one that makes believers. We make disciples, which come after believers. Okay? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your message this morning. And Lord, for I hopefully relieving us a little bit of that burden of, of what we sometimes see as success. Your word is plain. Success in a Christian life is being obedient to what you have asked us to do. No more, no less. And so, I would pray that you would remind us of the fact that successful evangelism is taking the opportunity to tell people about you and leaving the results to you and truly believing that it's you that gives the grace. It's you that grants the faith. And then after that, we can do our part. And now, Lord, be with us all as we go about our living our lives this week. Give us an opportunity to invite someone to your kingdom or to your church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.